Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for a Tax Practitioners Board webinar. My name is Julie Shaw, and I'll be hosting today's session. To begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Tax Practitioners Board acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now today's webinar has been created to connect directly with you, the tax practitioner community. We value your opinion and today is an opportunity for you to raise any questions that you have directly with us. Also following the webinar today, we will provide you with some helpful hyperlinks on some of the information that we're discussing throughout the presentation today. And we will send these to you via the email address that you've used to register for today's session. I'll also remind you that today's webinar does count towards your continuing professional education or CPE for short, and you can claim one hour for attending today's presentation. So as you've probably noticed, today's webinar is a little bit different to what we normally do. Um, rather than a presentation, this is going to be an open session where you can ask us questions in relation to your obligations as a registered tax practitioner. So simply um, navigate to the chat tab, which is located at the top of your screen there, and you can submit any questions that you like, and we will endeavour to answer as many as we can today. I just wanted to point out though, that if you have a specific question for one of our directors, could you please address them by name? I'll introduce them all to you in a moment, but um, if you could do that, that just makes it a little bit easier for us to moderate the questions. Um, and just a note here also that the questions are visible to the other attendees who are online with us today. So if you do have a question that's private in nature that you wouldn't really want everyone else to see, please use our online inquiry form. And you can find that located on our website, which is tpb.gov.au forward slash contact. So now just to begin, I will introduce the directors to you. Um, so today we have Nadia Harris, who's the Director of Policy and Legislation. We also have Christine Gordon, and Christine is the Director of Client Services. Uh, we have Craig Woodburn, who is the Chief Technology Officer for the TPB. We also have Sally Richards. Uh, Sally's the Director of the Legal Unit. And finally, we have Michael Campbell, who is our Compliance Director. And we're also very fortunate today to have Jeanette Liu, who is the TPB's Assistant Secretary, join us. And her focus today will be on policy, governance and reform. So I'm actually going to uh, just conduct a very quick poll to begin today, just to find out who we have online with us in the audience. So we'll start the poll and um, that will just pop up on your screen in just a moment. It's a very simple question and it is what type of tax practitioner are you? Are you a tax agent or are you a BAS agent? So I'm just going to give you some time to put through your responses there and I can see that we've got a few people putting through responses. So that's great. Thanks everyone for putting through those. And I will just keep it open for a few seconds longer just so that everyone gets an opportunity to put through a response. Okay, so I might close that off now because um, it looks like we've got quite a lot of responses there. And um, today we have roughly 78% um, in tax agents participation and about 21% of you are BAS agents. So thanks everyone for participating in the poll there. And um, let's get started on answering some of your questions today. So I might actually um, go to you, Jeanette, with the first question. And um, this one is, the TPB underwent an independent review and the Australian government released its response in 2022. Are you able to let us know what changes or reforms uh, tax practitioners can anticipate coming to them? Sure, thanks Julie for that question. So um, at a very high level, the government's response to the review, which was conducted by Keith James, was really around um, three key points. It was about enhancing, further enhancing the TPB's independence. It was also looking at um, opportunities to reduce red tape for tax practitioners. And also importantly, um, looking at changes to strengthen the framework for which um, people become registered. 
and remain registered with the TPB. So in essence, it's about strengthening the tax profession itself. Um, some of the changes that are being progressed that I did want to touch upon, um, Julie, with the concept of reducing red tape for tax practitioners, we have seen this um, occur quite significantly with the recent exit of tax financial advisors from the TPB's regime. And we're also currently looking at opportunities for the TPB to be uh, more flexible in what types of experience we're able to accept when we are looking at um, relevant experience, as well as any absences that people may have from the workforce. So there are just some examples there about how we're trying to make it easier from a regulatory um, point of view. We're also looking at um, reviewing all of the education and experience requirements as well. Um, the education requirements for tax and BAS agents, particularly um, BAS agents were set back in 2010. Tax agents were far earlier than that. And there really has been a holistic review as to whether or not they're still fit for purpose. So um, there's quite an active education work group looking at that at the moment. Um, and so that will be in a position to provide some advice to government as to how it might consider moving forward on this front. Um, the other thing that I think it's useful to touch upon with these reforms is that there is also a consumer element focus. Um, but we are looking at enhancing what information we can populate on our public register so that when consumers are looking for a practitioner, they're more informed. Um, and can make sure that they choose someone that meets their needs. So I think, Julie, it's fair to say that much of this work right now is in progress and it is very much ongoing. And while it might seem like the government announced its response to the recommendations in 2020, a lot has occurred during that time. And there definitely is an ongoing commitment by both the TV and by government to make really, really good our progress on these reforms. Thanks, Jeanette. Some really good um, information to start our webinar off today. Um, the next question that I have today is for Christine. Uh, so, Christine, I've got someone asking here, what should a tax practitioner do if they forget their username or password to log into their My Profile account? Hi. Um, if they forget their username or password, don't worry. You can easily recover them by clicking on the forget username or forget password link in my profile login page and follow the prompts. Um, there's two ways. If you're a registered tax agent, a tax practitioner and need to recover, you can complete all the mandatory fields and choose if you want to uh, receive your username by email or SMS. Based on your selection, your username will be sent to your email or your mobile. Um, if you aren't registered with us, then there's another option to select the I am applying to become a registered tax practitioner option and enter your email address in the fields. So when it comes to resetting your password, if you're a registered tax practitioner, you'll need to enter all the information and you'll get a confirmation code. If you aren't registered with us, then again, um, you can become registered by ent entering the option in the fields. Um, and then you'll receive an email or uh, with further information on how to reset. So thanks, Julie. Thanks, Christine. I think that's really useful because I think a lot of us forget our passwords. We have so many to remember these days. Um, so continuing with, I guess, the IT theme, I'm going to hand over to Craig now. Craig, I've got a question for you. Um, someone's asking here that the TPB is making some IT changes behind the scenes. Um, will these impact my profile? And um, will these changes affect how tax practitioners can renew their registration online with us? Thanks, Julie. Great question. Um, absolutely, it's correct. We're in the process of upgrading one of our core IT systems at the moment, um, the one that actually does all of our registration tracking and um, the one that actually does our My, my Profile. Um, our, our new business system will launch on the 11th of April and it'll accelerate our, our transformation to increase um, to basically give us increased opportunity for automation and uh, and data-driven decision-making. So uh, we're very much looking forward to this. Uh, it's been a long time coming. It's uh, worth noting that your My Profile and certain online forms, particularly complaints uh, and your change registration details forms, 
they'll be unavailable during our deployment window, which will be uh, 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 6th of April to the, I think it's 12 p.m., 12 p.m. on Monday, the 11th. So I'll just repeat that, 6.30 p.m. Wednesday, 6th of April to Monday, 12 p.m., uh, 11th of April. So uh, that's basically so while we upgrade our systems. Our call centre remain operational during this period, but of course we can't, we won't be able to help you with my profile issues because the system won't be available during that time. Now, if you need to log into your my profile account or use any online forms, uh, please obviously avoid that outage window that I've just mentioned. Um, additionally, to make the transmission, uh, the, sorry, the transition as smooth as possible, um, it's best just to make sure that your email address and your phone number are correct. Because uh, in these days with uh, cybersecurity risks and so on, we use multi-factor multi authentication um, to help you log on. So we often will send you a, a special code via email or your mobile phone. And uh, if those details are wrong with the new system, it just could be a little bit uh, more difficult for you to log on the first time. So once the upgrade is complete, uh, you'll be prompted to reset your My Profile password the next time you log on. Um, and uh, and your My Profile will look a little bit different, but it'll still be able to do all the same things that you can now. And we've consulted with tax practitioners and, and professional associations, um, just give them a, a bit of a rundown of the new system. And uh, and we'll be doing another demo yet before before we go live with it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's shaping up to be a, a success, a successful deployment on the 11th. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. So there's something really exciting for everyone to look forward to there. And um, we do have some information on our website about the outages as well. So if you jump onto our newsroom page, you'll see some information there. And um, we also have e-news coming out um, next month, which has some information in there as well about what will be happening around the, um, the Workbench program as well. Um, okay, so let's move on. I've got a question now for Nadia, and this one's about um, the continuing professional education policy for tax and buzz agents, Nadia. So um, people have noticed that there's going to be a change implemented on the 1st of July uh, this year. Can you please tell us uh, what the key changes are from the current policy? Yeah, thanks for that, Julie. Um, that's right. Our CPE policy is changing in a number of pretty important ways from 1 July this year. So firstly, under the new policy, um, tax agents should complete a minimum of 120 hours of CPE over a three-year period. So that's an increase from 90 hours over a three-year period in the current po policy. Uh, BAS agents should complete a minimum of 90 hours of CPE over a three-year period. Um, so that's being increased from 45 um, hours under the current um, policy over three years. Now, both tax and BAS agents should complete um, a minimum of 20 hours of CPE each year. So this has been increased, you might remember, from the current policy, which was that you needed to complete 10 hours per year um, if you're a tax agent and five hours per year if you're a BAS agent. Um, also, if you are a member of a recognised professional association, under the new policy, you'll be able to align your CPE period with the CPE period of your professional association. This means that you can essentially elect to have your CPE period based on, for example, a financial year or a calendar year, um, so that you just need to report um, your CPE at one particular date, um, rather than having different sort of due dates for different bodies um, and the TPB. Now, in recognition of the importance of health and wellbeing of tax practitioners, the new policy will also allow you to complete uh, health and wellbeing activities up to a maximum of 10% of the required CPA, of the total required CPE hours. So this can include activities like um, attending webinars about how to manage stress and self-care and that sort of thing. Uh, the new policy will reduce the current CPE record keeping requirement from six years down to five years which aligns with the ATO um, and several other professional associations requirements for record keeping. Um, just lastly, we've provided some greater clarification about certain exceptional circumstances that the TPB may take into account if a tax practitioner cannot meet the minimum CPE requirements. For example, um, in the event of family or caring commitments, uh, such as maternity leave or paternity leave. Um, so we will have some further clarity around those sorts of situations. 
Um, just lastly, it's important to note that uh, CPE activities are not limited to those activities that improve your technical knowledge per se. So other areas such as practice management and ethics are also really important. Um, so make sure you look out for those sorts of learning opportunities as well. Um, to help you understand the changes, we've actually developed a few handy fact sheets for tax agents and BAS agents to provide an overview of what the new requirements will be. And Julie will circulate these um, after the presentation today. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Nadia. And just in addition to the information that I'll be sending out later on today, I'll let everyone know that we do have a webinar coming up on the 15th of June, which will go through all of the CPE changes. So if you do want some information on that, it would be a great idea to register for that session as well. Um, and just before I do move on to the next question, I just want to point out that we are getting a lot of questions in the chat today that are ATO centric. Unfortunately, we cannot answer those questions, um, but we will pass them on to the ATO so that they may be able to put together some information for you uh, in their communication products as well. Um, okay, so I'll move on to another question, and this one's for Sally, our legal director. So Sally, as the director of the legal unit, can you tell us a bit about an interesting um, TPB court case that you've dealt with lately? Sure, thanks, Julie. Um, we've got a couple of civil penalty matters currently on foot in the federal court, and one of those is the Van Stro um, matter. So the uh, respondent in that matter's name is Jessa Van Stro, and she's also known as Jessa Loyola. Um, you may have, for those in the WA region, seen some recent media coverage about a hearing we had in relation to this matter last week. Uh, basically, we've made an application to the federal court to stop um, Ms Loyola from preparing and lodging income tax returns while she's not registered as a tax agent with the TPB. Um, we provided quite a bit of evidence from taxpayers based in the WA region indicating that Ms Van Stroh was illegally charging those clients fees to lodge returns on their behalf. Um, and basically, the federal court has made an interim uh, order to stop Ms. Van Stroh from lodging. And if she continues to provide tax agent services while she's not um, registered, then she may find and she'll face contempt of court and may even find, face fines and in, and in some circumstances imprisonment. The matter's next listed for hearing at the end of April, um, where we will continue, uh, consider the board's application for penalties. Um, given that her actions also put thousands of taxpayers at risk in that WA region, we took other steps outside of the legal system to try and help those affected taxpayers. So we wrote to all of the taxpayers and just recommended that they review their tax affairs given they'd had assistance from an unregistered preparer and that if they were concerned about anything that was claimed, they should seek assistance from a registered tax agent and the ATO. And in addition, we also collaborated with the Curtin University's Tax Clinic, which is known as the Curtin Tax Clinic, who offered free advice to those taxpayers that were affected by the actions of Ms um, Loyola. And, you know, we understand the, you know, severe implications that these types of unregistered preparers have on the system. So we'll continue to target those actions and um, stop them from acting on an unregistered basis. Great, thank you for that. Um, we might stay on law and compliance and go to Michael now. So. Um, Michael, are you able to let us know how many complaints against tax practitioners the TPB received in 2021 and what types of sources uh, did these complaints come from? Thanks, Julie. So the TPB receives complaints about registered tax practitioners from a range of external sources, and this includes members of the public, uh, other registered tax practitioners, government departments like the ATO, and uh, in the course of our own TPB investigations as well. In the 2021 financial year, we received about 2,000 total complaints uh, from a variety of sources. Most of these complaints were sourced from the public, which represented about 38% of the total number of complaints we received, uh, or from the ATO, which represented about 29% of the complaints we received. Interestingly, compared to the 2020 financial year, we saw a 4% overall increase in complaints and referrals in 2021 and ATO referrals increased by 140% during that period. And predominantly this was driven by matters which related to uh, COVID-19 stimulus referrals. All complaints that we receive and referrals are reviewed and they're subjected to a risk assessment to help determine a treatment strategy for each matter. And during 2021, we finalised most complaints within 30 days of allocating them to a case officer. If you'd like to make a complaint, uh, just go to our website and complete the online form available at tpb.gov.au forward slash make a complaint. 
Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, we'll send out a link as well uh, to the complaint form after the webinar today. Um, so I've just got a question now for Nadia. Um, this one's on proof of identity. Uh, could you just let us know, Nadia, do we need to do proof of identity on a client's bookkeeper? Oh, thanks, Julie. That's a really interesting one. Um, it will depend um, if the bookkeeper is representing the client in their dealings with you. So you're being approached by the bookkeeper to undertake work. Um, you will need to treat them as, an, as a representative of that client. So you'll need to um, ascertain their identity and also that they are authorised to provide you with those instructions on the client's behalf. Um, we did just have a webinar about POI this morning, so that will be um, available um, to watch, I think, um, after at some stage later on. So feel free to access that via our website and have a look at um, the POI information on there. Thank you for that, Nadia. Yep, the webinar will be available in the next uh, couple of days or so, and it'll be up on our YouTube channel. So if you do subscribe to the channel, you'll get a notification once it's live on there as well. Um, okay, so I've got a question now for Michael. So I'm going to go back to you on um, this one here. And it says um, that someone here has taken over a client from another tax agent. Um, when they did, they found that all the correspondence went to the old tax agent, not to the client. Um, there were 16 quarterly BAS statements not done, covering four years. Um, the company accounts had also not been prepared. The ATO imposed fines. Uh, so in this situation, what can the Tax Practitioners Board do to sanction the old tax agent? Um, so it's also going on to say here that the old agent will not forward records to the new agent. So um, there could be other errors involved. Thanks, Julie. I saw that question from Peter and I've just popped a message into the chat. So um, you and your client could make a complaint to the Tax Practitioners Board about that conduct uh, if you thought that the agent has breached the act. And so just on the face of it, there's a few questions that stand out to me about uh, what was the agent engaged to do during that period? Were they remunerated? Um, what agreements were in place? And so uh, with the consent of the client, if you think that the agent has breached the act, I'd recommend that you do go to our website and lodge a complaint uh, on behalf of your client. And we can look into that further and um, put some detailed questions. In, if you do decide to make a complaint, it's important that you give us as much information as possible as part of that process so that we can review the matter um, and engage with you meaningfully to try and get to the bottom of it. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, so I've got a question for Jeanette now. Uh, this one is about the update on TPV, sorry, TPV fee duplication um, for an agent that's also trading under a company. Is there any update on that, Jeanette, at all? Sure. Thanks, Julie. And I, I guess I wouldn't necessarily call it a duplication. Under the legislation that we operate under, if you are going to register as a company or a partnership, you need to satisfy the board that you've got a sufficient number of individuals that are registered with the TPB as well. So they are two separate fees, but I understand the point that there is you know, an element of the double payment there. Um, as part of the James review, which I spoke about earlier, the government um, did consider the possibility of moving um, registrations from a three-year basis to an annual basis. And as part of that, the government did commission a charge review be undertaken. So um, we would expect that that work, including a duplication point that was raised, would be considered as part of that. So there's nothing uh, immediately on the horizon, uh, but it's definitely under consideration. Thanks, Julie. Great. Thank you, Jeanette. So stay tuned on that one, I think. Um, so Sally, I've got a question for you here as well. Uh, this one is, can a BAS agent do some individual tax returns in order to register as a tax agent later? Thanks, Julie. I think Michael might have provided a short response to that in the public chat as well. But basically, uh, yes, they can, but they would they should be doing that under the supervision and control of the registered tax agent. And if they're not registered to provide that service, then obviously they cannot provide it for a fee. Um, but we would highly recommend they do it under the supervision and control of a registered tax agent so it can be considered relevant experience under the tax agent services regulations. Okay, great. Thank you. That's good to know. Um, Christine, I'm going to hand to you now. I've got another question here um, for you. And this one is, how can a tax practitioner add and remove a supervising tax practitioner from their practice? Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background to start off with. 
Uh, one of the registration requirements for a company or partnership to become a tax agent is to satisfy the sufficient number requirements. That means your entity must have an adequate number of registered individual tax agents. And this provides tax agent services to a competent standard and carry out supervisory arrangements on behalf of the entity. This is an ongoing uh, registration requirement. So when appointing registered individuals to provide supervision for your practice, you need to obtain their informed consent by way of a written signed uh, statement. You must ensure that they are considered um, all relevant information before accepting to take on the supervisory role, including the nature of the supervisory arrangements in place and the supervision and control to be undertaken. The only exception where the prior information written consent will not be required is in situations where you have existing documentation that sets out the nature of the supervisory arrangements and, um, and the supervision and control to be undertaken, and the nominated individual is aware and understands the obligations. So to add or remove a supervising agent, um, use our change registration form, which is on the website. The form requires you to provide certain information, including the first name, last name, registration number, date of birth, start and end dates for each supervising tax practitioner. You're either adding or removing. And um, Julie will send you a link to this form after the webinar today. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Christine. I'm gonna to head to Craig now. We've got another question for you. And this one is a pretty popular one. We do get it quite a bit, but I think it's really relevant um, at the moment as well. And it's what steps can a tax practitioner take to prevent a cyber attack? Thank you for unmuting me. <laughs> uh, the, the phrase of the decade, isn't it? Um, so uh, protecting yourself from cyber attacks, very topical at the moment. Um, obviously, to install, it involves more than just um, installing security software like virus checking, etc. Uh, of course, ensuring um, that you do have reputable antivirus software is, is a, a big part of it. And also anti-malware uh, would be another one that I'd recommend. Um, and some software providers even provide free versions uh, that I think are, are quite capable. In fact, you'll find most um, most government agencies these days, or very many, very few, very very many of them, um, would actually just use the built-in ones in Windows. Uh, generally, however, it's recommended that if you are an individual or a small or or medium organisation, you certainly should be referring to the Australian Cyber Security Centre um, uh, recommend recommendations. In particular, I'm thinking about what's called the Essential 8 Maturity Model. Um, and it's basically some guidance on how to mitigate the risk of cybersecurity incidents and how to train your staff uh, to be aware of simple risks. So um, I won't go through the whole Essential 8 and what they are, but, um, but it's, it's really worthwhile. And I follow it um, in our organisation. And, and if you're uh, running a business, then I'd say looking up that Essential 8 is really worthwhile. It's very simple and it includes a, a number of, of reasonably simple things like um, making sure Windows is up to date, making sure that your your email software is up to date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, if you're using Mac, you know, making sure your Mac OS is up to date, all those sorts of things. Um, training your staff also in awareness of the risks of uh, clicking on email links and, um, and potentially executing unsanctioned software uh, is, is a huge one, especially remote control software from scammers. I think the other night I received uh, a phone call from Telstra uh, wanting to remote control my computer to help me out with an issue. Um, of course, we've all had those sorts of things. Don't accept. Um, getting tricked into giving out personal details is another one, account names or passwords. So you you might want to, if, if, if all this is too rewarding for you, can I suggest that you actually engage an IT consultant or an expert to find a solution that meets your business's needs because um, sticking your head over the sand over, uh, over cyber security is not a good strategy. Um, hoping for the best, not a good strategy. So, yeah, that, that's probably about it from me. Thanks very much, Julie. Thanks, Craig. That was a really good, helpful advice. And I think some simple things that everyone can take on board as well. So thank you for that. Um, Nadia, I've got a follow-up question now for you about CPE. Um, so this person saying that I'm a registered R&D tax incentive 
oh, sorry, that they registered for R&D tax incentive work only. So will they um, be impacted by the new CPE requirements from 1 July? Yes, so conditional uh, tax agents um, will have a minimum of 45 hours over the three year period um, from 1 July. So um, our new uh, explanatory paper, which will be released, will detail um, the different types of sort of conditional agents and what their um, requirements will be. But generally, it will be 45 hours over a three year period. Great, thank you. Um, Jeanette, I'm going to go back to you again. Uh, could you let us know, uh, we've got tax financial advisors are no longer regulated by the TPB. Um, why did the government change the regulation of tax financial advisors and have the changes to establish the new single disciplinary body been finalised yet? Sure, thanks, Julie. Um, and I'll try to answer this question quite succinctly because I think in the poll you ran earlier, um, I don't think TFA was an option, but we had many tax agents um, in the webinar today. So in, in essence, um, the TPB, yes, we no longer reg regulate tax financial advisors, and that's because the regulatory space for financial advisors um, is quite complicated. There are many regulatory overlaps, um, not just with the TPB, but with other organisations such as ASIC, um, as well as um, previously the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority. So. Um, the reason for the change was to really reduce that regulatory burden on the financial advisor um, profession. And we have now seen that new body being established um, and it came into effect and operation on the 1st of January um, this year. Um, now, I do want to emphasize that while there is this new body regulating financial advisors, um, I hope that your rest of, you feel assured that there is still ongoing regulation of tax advice whether that's provided by your more traditional tax practitioners like tax agents and mass agents, or whether it's through financial advisors. So um, what we're seeing is that the TPB will still continue to regulate um, those that cannot get registered with ASIC, um, as well as those that are providing finan tax financial advice while unregistered. So um, while the government's initiatives were well, are about reducing red tape, um, I want to assure you it's not at the expense of the regulation of tax advice. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, Nadia, I've got another question for you about the proof of identity requirements. So this person's asking, in respect of proof of identity requirements where a tax agent has serviced a client for, say, 10 years or more, will the agent still be expected to conduct a POI check for these clients? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So we have dealt with um, this sort of scenario in our new practice note. Um, these sorts of clients we refer to as well-established clients. So what we do ask that you do, if you have a well-established client, um, and we do sort of go into a bit more detail about what this actually means in the practice note itself, um, but we ask that you make an assessment that they are in fact well-established and that you record that assessment um, in your file note um, about, you know, you know what sort of factors you took into account when deciding whether they are well established. If they are well established, you don't necessarily need to do undertake POI um, for that client before you provide services, um, but you do need to undertake that assessment. And we would suggest that you undertake that assessment on an ongoing sort of forward basis. If circumstances do uh, change with the client or if there are any red flags that you see, for example, you know, changes to the person who represents the client with you or changes to their bank account details or if they're asking you to lodge income tax returns or amendments to returns that um, yield a greater refund to them, then perhaps it's time to undertake some further inquiries and do do the minimum POI checks that we have in that practice note. So again, do, do go onto our website and have a look at the POI information that's on there or check out the webinar um, that will be released um, later in the week um, that we have this morning. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Craig, I'm coming back to you. Um, this time I've got a question about the portal. Um, someone's asking, can the time a tax agent is logged into the portal from logging to logging be extended? They're saying it's very time consuming and frustrating having to log into the portal so frequently. Thanks, Julie, for that question. It's funny, um, I was just writing up a response for Simon on that one. But um, thanks for your question, Simon, about the time a tax agent's automatically logged off from uh, their portal logon. 
the the TVB My Profile system currently logs you off automatically after one hour of inactivity, which seems like a reasonable time. Um, I have checked with my staff. Uh, or they're checking now to make sure that the new system has a similar time. But uh, that, that's that's what I'm, I'm chasing up now for you. But um, I'm wondering if maybe you were talking about the ATO tax agent portal instead, and whether that might be a, a less less of a time. So we could certainly raise that with the ATO, but raising that yourself um, as their customer will probably get your message across uh, quite effectively. So yeah, I'd suggest raising it with them. Thanks, Craig. That's a good point. Uh, so I've got another question for Michael now, and this one is, BAS agents are reluctant to make complaints as their details are provided to the other party. What can we do to stop our details being provided to other parties, um, especially if they've engaged lawyers to threaten the person who has made the complaint? Thanks, Julie. So you can make complaints to the Tax Practitioners Board and keep your identity anonymous if you'd wish. But uh, just keep in mind that if you do make an anonymous complaint, it would be very important to include all of the relevant information and details in your initial complaint because we may not be able to contact you again afterward. Otherwise, you can also put in your contact details but um, tell us in the complaint form um, by selecting a specific field that we have available in that form that you wouldn't like your identity disclosed. And that way, even though we wouldn't tell uh, the affected party your identity, we would be able to make contact with you after you've lodged the complaint with any additional follow-up questions that we have that might enable us to progress it. Sometimes we do run into instances where we are unable to progress complaints without uh, a person's identity being disclosed. And in those instances, we would make contact with the complainant and uh, let them know that they either have the option of having their identity disclosed and we'll progress the matter, or unfortunately, if they would like to remain anonymous, then the information that's available to us doesn't support further inquiries. Thank you. Uh, Christine, let's go back to you now. I've got a tax practitioner here that needs to surrender their registration. They were just wondering how they do that. Um, there's several reasons why a tax practitioner might want to um, surrender their registration. Um, it could be they're retiring, selling their practice, changing their business structure or becoming an employee of a registered uh, tax practitioner. If you decide to surrender your registration, you will need to let us know by writing. You can use the change registration form. Again, everything's on the website and uh, Julie will send you a link today. Um, once you surrender your registration, we must terminate your registration unless we consider that due to a current investigation or an outcome of an investigation, it would be inappropriate to do so. You may also refuse to accept your surrender request. We may also refuse your surrender if we start to investigate you within 30 days of receiving the surrender notice and we consider that it would be inappropriate to terminate your registration. If we decide not to accept your request to surrender, we will provide you with written uh, advice within 30 days of that decision and the reasons for the decision and the information on your rights of review. So if we decide to accept your registration, we will provide you with a written notice uh, within 30 days of the decision, provide you with reasons for the decision, advise you of the date your registration will cease, usually about 35 days from the date we notify you, provide information on your rights of review, notify the ATO of the decision and the reasons for the decision, uh, publish the decision by the notifiable instrument. On the date your registration ceases, your access to the ATO interface system will be closed meaning that you can no longer have access to online services or the portal. You'll also not be able to legally provide tax practitioner services for a fee or other rewards after your registration has ceased. If you want to operate as a registered tax practitioner, you need to submit a new application for registration and wait until that registration is approved. It's also really important that before your registration ceases, you have certain obligations that you need to meet. They include advising your clients that you are no longer a tax practitioner, 
to allow them to make alternative arrangements for their future needs. Um, ensuring your client's affairs are finalised before your registration ceases. If you're transferring your client's affairs to another registered tax practitioner, you must obtain your client's permission to do this. And also uh, notifying the ATO for the reasons of uh, surrendering. Uh, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Nadia, I'm going to direct the next question to you. This is another proof of identity. Seems to be a hot topic today. Um, this one's asking when um, the client verification checks will be mandated by the TPD. Yeah, sure. We we don't have a hard start date as yet for the POI requirements, and that's just because we're working really closely with the ATO um, in relation to releasing um, and mandating the requirements together. And they just have a few additional inquiries um, that they need to make and consultation that they want to undertake um, before we're ready. Um, what we will say, though, is that we um, strongly suggest that you start implementing POI procedures in your practice straight away. So start putting those processes in place. And we certainly will communicate with tax practitioners down the track um, when we have a hard sort of um, start date for the requirements. Great, thank you, Nadia. Uh, Sally, I've got a question for you now, and this one is, can a BAS agent advertise uh, tax services like financial reports and personal tax returns? Thanks, Julie. I think this one's also potentially been answered in the public chat box, but no, they cannot. They can only advertise BAS services. They can't advertise all tax agent services, which would include personal tax returns, so they shouldn't be advertising that kind of um service and if they are we would strongly recommend that you um, let the TPB know so that we can um, discuss it further with them. Great thank you very much for that. Um, Jeanette I've got a question for you and um, this one is with changes to the minimum CPE uh, what account has been taken of the financial impact of compliance which apart from registration and subscriptions could conservatively exceed $2,000 and be for some agents uh, their biggest single expense? Yeah, it's a really good question, Julie. It was definitely something that the board considered when we were developing our policy, and we did receive a lot of public submissions on this point. And when we, um, you know, really looked deep into it, I think it's fair to say that the starting premise is that an increase in hours doesn't necessarily mean an increase in costs. And the reason that I say that, um, there's probably about five or so reasons, and I'll try to rattle those off now. But the first one is that. The TPB's requirements largely are the same or lower than what the professional bodies require. And we do know that the majority of our individual registered tax agents and BAS agents, they are members of professional bodies. And the TPB does allow double counting um, generally, I'll say that generally. Um, so what you do for your association, you can also count for TPB requirements. So that's one reason why I don't think costs will necessarily increase. Um, another reason is that the CPA that we mandate or require in terms of hours does not need to be paid CPA. Things like today's webinar, for example, count towards CPA. The TPB, we offer quite a few um, every month. Um, other organisations do as well. So we would like to think that there are a lot of free CPA offerings out there and available. Um, the TPB, we've also maintained the 25% technical reading component, um, which means that any, I'll call it private reading that you may do, reading journals, um, magazines, etc., um, will also count towards your CPA. Um, I'll say this one lastly. What we found through our experience with setting the requirements is that a lot of BAS agents and tax agents were actually um, under calculating how much CPE they actually do. When we went through with them and looked at their activities, there were lots of things that they did not count that they should have counted. So hopefully with the enhanced articulation of the requirements on the website, um, it won't be um, too much of a cost impost um, for tax practitioners. But we are committed to review our requirements. And if we find that there is a significant cost burden on the profession, we will definitely um, relook at those requirements and see if a reduction may be appropriate. Thanks, Julie. 
Thanks, Jen. I think that's probably reassuring to a lot of people online today. Um, the next question I have is for you, Michael, and this is actually a follow up to the one that I just asked Sally about as agents who advertise tax agent services. Could you please let us know what the TPV is doing about these FAS agents um, and how do you report this to the TPV and will they take serious action um, upon such a complaint? Yeah, so um, thanks, Julia. It's important that if you see a practitioner advertising services which they're not entitled to advertise or not entitled to provide, that you pr report those to the CPP. Um, we have a fairly active unregistered preparers compliance program at the moment. There's a number of cases on foot. And as part of that, um, a, a tier of different responses that we use to address that misconduct. And at the lowest tier, um, that would involve us making direct contact with that BAS agent and asking them to remove that material from their website. Um, so if you see uh, somebody advertising services that they're not entitled to advertise, um, please do make a complaint on our website. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so the next question that I have here is for Craig. So um, Craig, we've got a question here about data breaches. Um, so what happens when personal information is um, accessed or disclosed? Um, and how should a tax practitioner respond to a data breach if they fall victim to one? Thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm hoping, yep. Okay, great. People can see me. So, uh, yes, data breaches are, uh, yes, they can be caused or, or made worse by a variety of factors, obviously, um, including uh, the different type of information or or even um, that, that could affect the, the harm or potential harm or even perceived harm um, on individuals and entities. So, really, as such, there's no single way to deal with responding to a data breach, but let me just share uh, probably three or four principles that, that, that I would use. Um, each breach would need to be dealt, obviously, on a case-by-case -case basis, basis with a, an understanding of the risks um, posed by that breach. And, uh, and obviously, you'd need to be um, particularly um, effective in removing those risks or, or addressing them. Uh, generally, the actions that I'd take would be, firstly, I'd, I'd try and, um, and stop any further compromise of personal information. So the first thing is to, to stop it getting worse. So um, in the worst of cases, and I've never come to this, but I would, um, in the worst of cases, secure your systems, even if it means turning them off um, to uh, stop any further compromise um, and calling in security professionals or disconnecting, you know, maybe disconnecting your systems from the internet. The next thing, of course, would be to assess the damage. So assess the data breach by gathering the facts, evaluate the risks, um, including what potential harm would have been presented by the data that's been breached. Uh, take, take any action to remediate any risk of harm and be sure to check uh, the logs of your systems to assess the size of the breach, uh, how many clients were impacted, uh, how many people access the data, et cetera. Uh, good logs are always worth, worthwhile. Thirdly, I'd uh, notify, um, have a think about who you need to in inform, basically. Do you need to inform the individuals? Is it serious enough that you do need to? Do you need to inform the Office of the Australian Information Com Commissioner, the OAIC? Um, there, are, there are certainly guidelines on uh, reportable data breaches. Uh, if a breach is a, an eligible data breach under the notifiable data breaches scheme, um, then it might be mandatory for you to do that. And if you're, you're unfamiliar with that, um, Julie can send you a link to that from a previous webinar that we've had on data breaches. And then finally, um, I would say the, the most savvy of leaders would, would have to actually go and, and uh, retrospectively look at all this once you're finished and, and look at what you can do to prevent future breaches. Uh, what are the risks that you didn't see and how can you mitigate those risks more effectively into the future? So, yeah, that would be how I'd always end this. Um, but, yeah, certainly, as I've said, uh, stop further damage, uh, assess the damage that's been caused already work out who you need to tell and um, and then uh, protect yourself from the future. And of course, there might be some cleanup um, associated with that reporting. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I have a question for you here from Sarah. So Sarah's saying that during the lockdown, she lost some clients just because um, 
couldn't apply for them to receive government grants, um, which they were actually not eligible for. And they ended up going to other accountants and receiving the grant. So is that something that can be reviewed by the TPB? Thanks, Julie. Yes, it is. You could refer that matter to us and then we can look into whether the agent that those clients have moved to have misunderstood um, those COVID stimulus measure uh, provisions. Um, because we have access to ATO systems, including taxpayer data and compliance cases, we'd be able to look into that in more detail. So if you suspect that that's what has occurred, then feel free to refer that to us and we can look into it further. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Christine, I've got a question for you now. And this one is, um, if a practitioner wants to transfer from an individual to a company tax agent, do they need to maintain both registrations with the TPB? And um, they're also asking, do we need to maintain insurances as well? Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, if you provide tax or BAS services for a fee or a reward, you have to be registered with us. And you can register either as an individual partnership or company. So the company or partnership must have sufficient number of registered individuals to provide tax agent services. Uh, to a competent standard and to carry out supervisory work uh, arrangements. There's no set limit or formula. Well, there is a, a limit, but there's no set formula to meet the sufficient number. Um, it should be at least uh, one registered tax agent or BAS agent and determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we recognise uh, what is sufficient number of individuals will depend on individual circumstances and the work they carry out. So some factors you probably need to consider are the size of the business, the services being offered, the supervisory arrangements in place, the conditions um, uh, imposed on the partnership. So supervisory arrangements are arrangements aimed at directing and overseeing and checking the services. And again, there's a whole range of um, different requirements um, and uh, that determine adequate supervisory arrangements. So back to the question of uh, whether you need, um, if, you're an if you're a company, you will need an individual registration. Um, in terms of uh, PII, which is the Professional Indemnity Insurance, um, you can, as an individual, you can use the PII of the company. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Christine. I've got two quick questions, uh, Jeanette, for you on CPE. And the first one is, um, how do we differentiate structured and unstructured CPE? So I might get you to answer that one first and then I'll come to you with the second question. Okay, no worries. So it seems like CPE, POI are the hotbed questions. Um, with CPE, structured and unstructured, it's not language that we really use in our requirements. Um, it's quite commonly used by the professional associations. But in essence, um, the unstructured refers to that 25% private technical reading that I spoke about earlier. This is where you might be reading like a journal article, etc. Some of the structured would be like today's webinar where there's a clear um, subject matter that's going to be discussed as an outline. We know exactly what's going to occur. So attending a conference, for example, would be structured. So I think that's be the best that I can answer it, uh, Julie, um, at this stage. Thanks, Jeanette. That's helpful. Um, the second part of the question that I've got is um, the 25% reading requirement. Uh, is that going to be extended beyond the 30th of June? And if so, for how long? Yeah, so the, the board's status, well, the board's ongoing requirements for CPE is a built-in 25% private reading. Um, but if the reference is in relation to the COVID concessions, the TPB has put in place now for a number of years um, a concession recognising the impacts of COVID. So we lifted that 25% private reading uh, cap to essentially say you can do 100%. Um, that's due for review by the board in the next couple of months. Um, so until we have a decision, um, I can't preempt what the board may decide. But, you know, again, rest assured, the board is very mindful about the um, pressures and imposts that are currently being placed on the profession. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, I might uh, hand this question over to Sally. Uh, so Sally, as a BAS agent, um, this person has been approached by a registered tax agent 
to provide income tax preparation under his registration. Um, is there any issue with doing this or communicating it with the clients um, under a supervision, uh, sorry, a supervision arrangement? Thanks, Julie. Um, there's no issue with the BAS agent doing the preparation for the tax agent. Um, they just, we would expect that they'd be um, clear with their clients as to the circumstances of the arrangement. I'm not sure I fully understand that particular question, but we would recommend that they have appropriate supervisory arrangements in place and ultimately the one that would be lodging those returns would be the tax agent and they would need to ensure the veracity of the information in those returns. Um, we would suggest they go online and look at our um, documentation about supervision and control and the competence uh, tax agent services and contractor relationships. Excellent, thank you for that, Tommy. Uh, Nadia, I've got a question for you, and this one is, um, if we have a tax agent who has cancelled their registration, does this affect the necessity of maintaining uh, professional indemnity insurance? In particular, they're thinking um, what happens if a possible insurance claim comes up after they've cancelled. Thanks, Julie. Um, a really, really good question um, from that person. So. One of the requirements um, for professional indemnity insurance um, cover is that you have runoff cover. So that's a pretty standard um, aspect of most PI insurance policies. What runoff cover means is that after you are no longer a registered tax practitioner um, and therefore you are no, no longer have your PI insurance policy in place, you will still be covered um, for any claims um, that are made in relation to the services you provided during the registration period. So that runoff cover will last until the, um, generally I think it's until the statutory time limits have expired um, for those sorts of um, claims that can be brought against you. So as long as your cover meets our um, minimum PI insurance requirements, most of them will, but do check our website if you need some more information on that you'll be covered even after you stop being a registered tax agent. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Uh, so I think we've got time for one last question today. And uh, Michael, you're the lucky recipient of the last question of the day. And this one is, uh, we have an instance of a non-response from a tax agent um, to our practice or to the taxpayer to our ethical letter, which included a request for information. Um, so they're saying that they haven't responded to emails or phone calls. Uh, should a complaint against this tax agent be made to the TPB? Thanks, Julie. Um, I think it's a matter that you could raise with us if you are having difficulty in making contact with them. Um, certainly, uh, many of the complaints that we receive is actually facilitating a conversation or dialogue, dialogue between a complainant and a registered tax agent. So that, um, there might be some issue there that we can assist with, and if we can, we're certainly happy to assist and, and look into that for you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your advice on that one. So just to finish up today, I'm going to give you some information on how to stay in touch. So if you do want some more information or to keep up to date, as we said today throughout the presentation, you can have a look at our website, which is tpb.gov.au. We um, also have social media channels that you can follow us on, which include LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, there's also a newsletter that we send out each month called TPB eNews. And you can subscribe to that on our newsroom page on our website, which is tpb.gov.au forward slash newsroom. There's always lots of great updates in there monthly. So I would encourage everyone to subscribe to that if you're not already. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, today's webinar has been recorded and all of our previous ones have as well. So you can actually uh, watch any of our webinars at your leisure and still claim your continuing professional education for watching them, which is great. So I want to say a big thank you to Jeanette, Nadia, Christine, Craig, Sally and Michael for sharing their insights today. I think uh, there was a lot of great questions being asked and some great responses put there as well. So um, thank you to everyone in the audience. Uh, we couldn't have run this webinar without your participation today. So thank you for your great questions coming through. And um, we do hope that you did find it beneficial. And um, as we always say, the webinars are a really great way for you to keep up to date and um, they do count towards your continuing professional education. I will just say that we do not issue attendance certificates, but we do issue an email following up from the webinar that you can use as evidence of attending today. Um, so if you are interested in attending any more of our webinars, just once again, jump on our website, tpb.gov.au forward slash webinars. 
and um, we've got a few listed there that are coming up soon. And one final thing before we do finish up today, I uh, would like to launch an exit survey. It's very quick, only takes a moment, and it's really helpful to us to guide us on topics that you might be interested in hearing about, and also just some ways that we can improve on what we're doing to help you as well. So the survey just pops up in your browser when you leave the webinar today, so please take the time to complete it. We really appreciate it. And once again, thanks everyone for joining, and um, we do hope that you enjoyed the rest of your day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.